ka tangi te titi, ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki hao te e Māori ora. E na mana, e na reo, e ora raka te rama tēnā koutou katoa. Ko wai au, ko Richard Blake i Taka Wingama, nō oto poti a hao, ko kotarani te iwi, he kai mai hi hao te whariwananga o o tākau, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā rā kātou kātoua. Uh, no mai, how do I welcome everyone to this inaugural professorial lecture where we celebrate the achievements and promotion of Professor Sean Halcrow. Uh, my name is Richard Blakey. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Enterprise here at the University of Otago. And I'm here representing the Vice-Chancellor, Professor David Murdoch, who sends his apologies, but as I understand, is uh, quite an aficionado of watching uh, these events online or, or subsequently. So uh, welcome, Sean. And congratulations on your achievement. Tēnā uh, koutou, um, kei rangatira, to the, to the other uh, members of the academic party, welcome. To members of our university community, tēnā koutou, welcome. Uh, to our visitors from the Dunedin City and around the world on online, welcome as well. But I'd like to extend a special welcome to um, special guests of Shan. Your daughter, Alia, is here, and I believe you're Parents Jeanette and Rob are here. Yeah, kia ora, kia ora, kia ora. Uh, you've got a brother, niece, nephew, great niece, and friends from family far and wide, both here and online. So to you all, um, no mai, haramai, welcome. And uh, this is a, a wonderful celebration event. And it's something in the calendar of academic leaders at the university that we look forward to every week, that it is a time where we can reflect in the achievement of our um, academic staff <clears throat> in reaching that status of professor at the university. Uh, our event tonight is, uh, is quite straightforward. Uh, the Dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences, Professor Lisa Mattisu smith will give a detailed uh, introduction of the speaker uh, and we'll get a vote of thanks uh, at the end before we uh, have refreshments afterwards. But I just want to spend one or two minutes giving you an outline of, of what it means to be promoted to professor at the University of Otago. <clears throat> we require our professors to be uh, outstanding in their field and their discipline, in their ability to both generate new knowledge through research and to disseminate knowledge through teaching. Uh, good researchers uh, are very um, celebrated here, but you have to be an excellent teacher as well. And you have to contribute service to your discipline, uh, to your community, uh, and to others as well at the highest level. <clears throat> we uh, also require our professors to sh demonstrate strong leadership in their discipline and in their areas as well. And as you'll see tonight through the introduction and the and the lecture that in Sean Halcrow we have someone that has demonstrated those attributes um, to the highest standard um, uh, as I attest through looking at her CV but also we use international referees to make sure that we benchmark our standards to, to the best global university. Um, Sean's going to tell us a really great story and um, look I could I could talk about the fact that her research is globally recognised, that it requires a lot of effort to do the work in the field where she does it. I could talk a lot about her, the strength and high, how highly valued her teaching is across years from 100 level up to postgraduate level. Uh, I could talk about her outstanding service, but I think what I'll do is just leave it there and offer the sincere congratulations on behalf of the university to your most well-deserved uh, promotion, Sean, and uh, now invite uh, Professor Lisa, Lisa Matisu smith the Dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences, to introduce our speaker for you. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Lisa Madisu smith Takunga. Thank you, Richard, and thank you everybody for coming here um, tonight uh, to celebrate uh, this event and, um, and celebrate, celebrate Shan. So, um, as Richard explained, I am the acting dean of the biomedical sciences, um, but I was formerly the head of department of anatomy um, and professor of biological anthropology. So it is particularly, um, I'm particularly proud to be able to celebrate with you, Sean, and with all of you tonight, um, that we are celebrating uh, Sean's 
inaugural professorial lecture. So um, as Richard said, we could go on for, for all night talking about all of the amazing things that Sean has achieved, um, but I'm going to try to keep it short and to the point because you're really here to listen to us. We all are here to listen to, to Sean uh, talk about her research. So just a little bit about Sean. Um, she is a renowned bioarchaeologist and honored internationally for her groundbreaking work. She has reshaped our understanding of the impacts of the agricultural transition on society through studying the health and experiences of the most vulnerable infants and children. These revolutionary changes of past human societies have major repercussions for much of the world today, particularly those living in poverty and in sanitary crowded conditions. Sean interrogates central archaeological models of the intensification of agriculture and of human responses during the seminal time in prehistory in diverse environments. And these are generally environments that have been ignored historically um, due to Eurocentric perspectives. Um, so uh, she has managed skeletal analyses and projects in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, China, and Chile, and has an outstanding international reputation through her use of cutting edge methods and contributions to theoretical approaches in the study of childhood in the past, and a commitment to ethical practices in her field. And she is particularly well known for, for these two areas and is an invited and requested speaker uh, around the world. Since 2007, Sean has published more than 120 peer-reviewed publications in the highest impact journals and books in, in our field. Um, she is co-editor-in-chief co of one of the most innovative journals in the subject, Bioarchaeology International, and has produced several editions that are transforming the future of the discipline. Uh, and she sits on numerous international academic boards and associations. Her prominence in the study of infancy and childhood in the archaeological past is internationally unmatched. She is truly a pioneer uh, in the field, um, and particularly focusing on the first thousand days of life from conception uh, through, through childhood and the maternal environment uh, and the later life outcomes of what happens during these periods. This topic is um, central to the, the mother-infant nexus, which she will be talking to us about and understanding the evolution of our species. She uh, is, has co-edited um, a book called The Mother-Infant Nexus in the Past, Small Beginnings and Significant Outcomes, uh, and it has received international um, recognition and has sold more than 10,000 copies uh, to date. And this was published in 2020, so uh, truly, truly impressive. She has external research funding of more than five and a half million dollars from international organizations, including Winter Gren, National Geographic, the Australian Research Council, the Fondacy, which is the Chilean National um, Fund for, if I can remember, the, the Innovation, Science, and Technology, I think is, is what um, the Chilean uh, NSF uh, virtually is, um, and of course here numerous Marsden grants uh, and a Fulbright Travel Award. Her honors include uh, election, to, and she is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in London um, in 2018. She won the University of Otago Roweith Trust Award and Carl Smith Research Medal in 2018, uh, and the New Zealand Association of Scientists Hill Tinsley Medal um, also in 2018. Um, so that's kind of, you know, just, just a, a glossing over uh, of Sean's accomplishments on paper. Um, but it just, you know, it's quite amazing when I think back. I actually knew Sean as a first year student at the University of Auckland, um, where I think I was her tutor for the introduction of biological anthropology. And then later I taught her at 300 level um, in the history of anthropology. And, uh, Sean stood out even then. I still remember marking her first year exam. And one, she had very, very neat handwriting. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, she was one of those students that, that just, you know, clicked 
really got it and, and you kept an eye out for those students. And so when she came into the history of anthropology paper that I was teaching in, um, it was not surprising that she topped the class and those were inevitably the students that, that really we, we targeted for, for post-grad study. So I was most distraught when she disappeared <laughs> and she was no longer there as a student in the anthropology department at Auckland and I had wondered what happened to her and uh, was thrilled to find out that she stayed in the field, but she'd moved down here to Otago um, and it was, was doing her honors with Nancy Taylor, and then carried on and did her PhD. So she was awarded her, her BA ONS in 2002 um, and then her PhD in 2007. So um, tonight uh, we get to hear Shan talk about her research in bioarchaeology or the study of human remains from archaeological contexts. Um, and we will see how her research really focuses on major questions about social transformations in the human past. So she will be talking to us about the agricultural transition and the impact that it has had, uh, and in particular, the negative impacts on past human populations. Um, and and um, using a number of, of excellent case studies, um, really interesting uh, examples from diverse regions around the world. Um, she will demonstrate uh, the value of this um, multidisciplinary approach um, and the importance of uh, highly contextualized interpretation, um, which takes skill that um, I think you will see uh, Sean demonstrating tonight. So um, please join me in welcoming Shan to give uh, her inaugural professorial lecture. And the title of it is Sensitive Little Souls, Insights into Our Past. To start off with the karakia, tu tawa mai i runga, tu tawa mai i raro, tu tawa mai i roto, tu tawa mai i waho, ki a tau au te maori tu, te maori ora ki te katoa, humi e hui e tai ki e. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko kakanua te maunga, i ru nei taku nāko, ko waitaki te awa e mahia ne aku maharahara. No oamaru a hau, e mihi ana ki nga tohu o nehe o otipoti i noho nei au. Ko Shan Hout Krotoku Ingoa, he tangaturiti a hau. Nō reira, tina koutou, tina koutou, tina koutou katoa. Thank you very much for the introduction. It was really lovely, um, Richard and Lisa. I really appreciate that. And thank you very much to Neil and Christine as well, who you'll hear from later. Thank you very much for coming to my family um, and friends who are like Fano to the, the Tahiko Calverts um, and to Frisbees as well who are here somewhere. Um, just a little bit of a content warning. I don't have many pictures, but there will be some photos of human remains. So some people may feel uncomfortable with that, but I've tried to limit them somewhat, but it was a bit hard with the content that I was talking about. Before I start, I just wanted to dedicate this to my firstborn, Casey Halkrow, who hopefully is watching this um, on live stream. Um, Casey was born uh, near the end of my PhD and so has endured research um, and my academic professional development since the in utero period um, and has had some major um, fantastic um, experiences overseas in terms of learning about new cultures, um, learning different languages. She spoke a lot of Thai when she was one and a half, probably more Thai than English. Um, but it also came with some stresses um, along the way. And you know that I cry with the drop of a hat. Um, so this is dedicated to her. And I also wanted to acknowledge her little sister, Aaliyah, who woke up at 3 a.m. this morning. <laughs> she looks up to her older sibling so much. Apart from myself, you're my greatest critics. And I love you both to the moon and back. 
So I was thinking the other day when I was watching Aaliyah, my, my eight-year-old, she was um, working with clay, and I thought, actually, this would be a very good analogy to use in teaching in the concepts that we use in bioarchaeology and biological anthropology. We look at the body as being shaped. It's constantly being remodelled and shaped by the environmental circumstances that we live in. Um, and I, look, I came across this picture of this um, plasticine person and I thought this was a very good one because it shows different steps and you could liken those to steps in development throughout life. But even though you develop and you move further along that trajectory, you're always connected to the start point, you're always connected to, to the maternal environment. Okay. And that maternal environment has so many um, effects on your later life health, um, which is really important to, to think about um, in our work. And when I was thinking about this in the context of teaching, I also thought, actually, this is a very good an analogy for thinking about um, professional and academic development, because it doesn't happen in a vacuum, um, and I've been moulded and helped along the way by many, many people. So a lot of this IPL is actually talking about the influences on me and the people who helped me along the way. This is a photo of me. How old was I? Four months? It's gone blank here, but it's up there. Um, and that hand is actually my maternal grandmother's hand. Um, I remember she was so kind to me. She died, I think I was about seven. Um, and I always remember her bangles, always clanging away. Um, I, uh, my parents are here, um, and I've, I'm one of five siblings, and we're first generation university goers. Um, I, I was born not too um, uh, far before the 1980s, I won't give away my, <laughs> my date. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was born in, born in Auckland and then um, our family moved down to central Southland which was a bit of a shock and then in my primary school years we moved up to Oamaru and I spent most of my um, primary I spent most of my primary school there and also most of my high school years I found school to be um, in Oamaru anyway a bit understimulating um, and it didn't really extend me very much, but I had the opportunity to actually go up to Auckland for my seventh form year, which is year 13 these days. And I had some fantastic teachers there who really extended me. And um, I was looking through some of my boxes the other day, sentimental items, I like to get rid of stuff. And I came across a little note from my biology teacher, Miss Iremia and it said, she must have given it to me at the end of seventh form year, she said, what are you doing at university? Are you doing biology? And in fact, I did. I went to the um, Auckland University and I started biology. We were always kind of, um, well, I was always kind of pushed down the track of science and mathematics, because I was, there was a notion that it was too bright to do stuff like you know, humanities, history, and that kind of stuff, which is a bit silly, really, looking back on it. Um, but I really did love um, social science. I loved um, the gender studies papers that I was taking at Auckland University and obviously the anthropology papers I was taking as well. Um, and then I found out about biological anthropology and I thought, well, this is great. You can actually combine these things together. And uh, Lisa was talking about the paper that I took, for the history of anthropology. And um, it's kind of stayed with me. Um, so it's a paper that I remember very well. Um, it was a full field approach, um, but I remember the biological anthropology in particular. Um, and thinking about our academic discipline in the context of um, social and political climates. And that's what I always like to do when I'm thinking about why we're doing what we do in biological anthropology and um, I think it's really stimulated my interest in theoretical approaches in social bioarchaeology. Between my second and third year, I must have done the third year paper in my second year, um, I, I came down to um, Otago, I may have seen the light, as you could say, 
and I did um, a paper that was formerly Anthropology 307 and it was taught by Halle Buckley and, and um, Nancy Taylor. And I really loved it. For one, we were working for our labs in the Anatomy Museum and I just thought, wow, I didn't know that these kinds of resources actually existed number one, and two, I really like the practical aspect of learning about human biology, um, skeletal, um, about, the, about bones, but also it was very um, contextualised um, with an anthropological thought. Um, so I decided that I want to continue down that track and Nancy Taylor took me under her wing for my fourth year um, and uh, she must have thought I was okay because she invited me to go to Thailand at the end of my fourth year. And that was actually the first field season from uh, at Ban Non Wat, which is a very important prehistoric Thai site um, in the Isan area. Um, it's been excavated by Charles Hyam and Dr. Rachini Tosserat. Um, I actually put this picture here um, of the so of one of the excavation pits, there were three main excavation squares, and this one was particularly deep. But they also um, this um, excavation square also had a lot of infants and children that were being excavated in there. And Nancy said to me, I remember her saying, "You know, Sean, you're so much better at me than e at excavating these." I want you to focus on the square and I'll focus on the main square. And if I need any help, I'll come, you know, and ask you for help and you can come along to the main square. And I thought, oh, this is really good. She must think I'm really good at excavating and <laughs> really good at juvenile osteology. And it wasn't until years later that I realised she was quite anxious to go down the pit because it was so, so deep <laughs> and <laughs> scared about it. But that aside, Nancy was an amazing and still was an amazing mentor. I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for her. She always gave me so many opportunities and she was um, very thorough, she was very scholarly, but she also had a lot of patience and um, she was also very lovely to my children and understood um, you know, the challenges of having uh, children and doing field work. And I've been very privileged to be able to work in many different parts of the world, so I've collated a little video which I hope will work, just to show you some of those places. It's not going to be too loud. <coughs> Right, we don't need the music. So now moving on to my research, I suppose you could uh, categorise my research into three main themes. The first is what I'm going to be talking about tonight in some detail, and I'm very interested in looking at the question of major social changes of the human past and the changes which happen in, in response to things like climate change, um, agricultural development and intensification, and also the intensification of um, social inequality, or the increase in social inequality, and quite often these go hand in hand together. I'm also very interested in the ethics of bioarchaeological practice, and um, we often work in different places of the world, so it's really important to think about that. Um, and I'm also very interested in the bioethics 
um, of historical legacy collections that are held in museums and institutions. And I've got research um, throughout New Zealand and also starting in the US looking at some of those questions. And as I said before, I'm very interested in um, the development of social theory um, or the adoption of social theory and incorporating that into bioarchaeology. So the general model of health change with the agricultural development and intensification persists that there was a general deterioration in human health. And that came about for, for a number of reasons. People began to become sedentary, living in the same spot. Can you not hear me, Mum? Is it all right? Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks, Mum. <laughs> um, with um, sedentism, um, there was also the ability for um, populations to grow. People were living in denser settlements, and that brought around um, insanitary living conditions. Also, with agricultural food crops, um, there was there's generally a reduction in dietary um, diversity and therefore nutritional um, value in diet. And also with agriculture, you've obviously got the domestication of animals and more propensity for disease transmission between animals and humans. And we saw this very um, well with COVID, for example, which is a zoonotic disease. So my work tests um, this general bioarchaeological model um, in the range of human responses in very diverse environments. And I'll be going through some case studies showing you how I do that. Now you might be thinking, why on earth do I care about this? What is the relevance of looking at this today? And it is extremely relevant because more than half of the population of the world actually lives in insanitary, very crowded living conditions and that has its ultimate roots with the development of agriculture and the demographic transition that occurred at that time. And we're obviously um, reliant on agricultural food crops as well. Um, so I'm looking at the, the ultimate origins of that. Now in bioarchaeology over the last um, 10 or 15 years, it's become widely acknowledged that looking at infant and child health is a very sensitive measure of overall overall population health. Um, and my lab's been looking at um, the mother-infant nexus in health in the past. This hasn't been looked at as much, but I would argue that it's probably the most sensitive way in which we can look at overall population health. That's because during pregnancy, we've got increased energetic requirements for both the mother and the baby. Um, and pregnant mothers are more susceptible to new disease and to malnutrition and the exacerbation of disease as well during pregnancy. And we know that the uh, health experience during um, the in utero period can have lifelong effects on um, adult health. So my lab's been looking at different ways in which we can interrogate the maternal infant nexus and look at um, maternal um, transmission of stress to the infant. And we can look at this in a number of ways. I've done a lot of work looking at infant um, mortality, um, and I've had students that have been looking at developing methods, looking at physiological stress through dental enamel defects on the teeth. Um, for example, we can look at specific um, teeth that formed during the in utero period, and they can tell us something about um, in utero stress. Um, we can also look at evidence of uh, pathology, so uh, bone pathology um, on infants, and that can tell you something about maternal stress as well. And we can look at the maternal infant nexus by interrogating infant diet and also weaning using chemical methods. So um, as Lisa alluded to before, this general model of health change with agricultural development is based mainly on research in Europe and North America. And when I was starting to think about what I wanted to do for my PhD, a lot of work was coming out of Southeast Asia and it was showing that the, that um, general health change wasn't um, being recognised in the bioarchaeological data in Southeast Asia, and there were various hypotheses put forward for why that was the case. 
So I was interested in looking at this question of agricultural change and health change. And I looked at this um, and looking at this through infant and child human remains. Um, because there's a long standing um, research collaboration between Charles Hyam at the University of Otago and um, the Thai fi Finance Department, there'd been a lot of excavations that had been done, and they'd be pr done primarily in, in northeast Thailand, and he also excavated the site of Kot Phnom Di. Um, so I was able to look at the infant and child component of these different sites and I chose these different sites because they range from about 4,000 years ago, which is around the time of the development of agriculture in the region, through to about 1,500 years ago, which was the time um, when um, or the so-called Iron Age, and that was a time when you had increased technological development and the um, intensification of wet rice agriculture in the region. So unfortunately, I didn't actually find any clear deterioration in health, even though I really wanted to find something. I looked at a lot of different methods. I looked at infant mortality. I looked at um, growth disruption in the teeth. I looked at physical uh, linear growth. And I also looked at oral health to see if there was any changes in that with subsistence change. And I also tried to look at evidence for skeletal pathology to look at bone disease. Um, a problem that we have in the archaeological record is a lot of the Iron Age sites actually had really bad bone preservation, so I wasn't able to look at some of the skeletal pathology, but there was hints that there was an increase in infection rate in the Iron Age. Um, but I did find that there was a statistically significant um, increase in infant mortality in the Iron Age, so something was going on there in terms of a health transition. So I maintained interest in that um, and I continued in my postdoc and over the years to excavate at um, sites at, in, in the Upper Moon River Valley in northeast Thailand because you'll notice whoops, that while these sites are in the general vicinity to each other, I couldn't necessarily control for environmental differences because they're in different geographical locations. Um, but we started to excavate um, some new sites that were very, very close to each other. And the site of um, Ba Non Wat as well had a very long archaeological sequence, so we could compare the different um, phases within the one site. So this is just showing you um, some of the demographic data that we had from these sites that are very close together in the Upper Moon River Valley in northeast Thailand. And it's showing the proportion of um, infants and children um, in the different age groups under 19 years of age. And you'll see in the Iron Age, you've actually got a statistically significant increase in the um, under one-year-olds. And you can also see that you've got some more preterm deaths as well in the late Iron Age. Um, so what does this mean? Maybe we're having a later health transition in the Iron Age and that kind of does make a bit of sense in terms of what we know about social and environmental change at that time. We find um, archaeological evidence for these massive big moats for water storage and it's thought that those moats are used for the irrigation for the wet rice agriculture. Um, but when you have standing water like that, um, it's not very good for waterborne diseases and the transmission of those to, to humans. Also, we see that there's a um, increase in social inequality through the archaeological evidence at these, at these um, Iron Age sites. And we also see archaeological evidence for the domestication of animals and also the crawling of animals into spaces that are very close to um, the human habitation sites. So this could also increase the transmission of zoonotic disease. Now moving to a very different place in a very different case study, um, now to the Atacama Desert, which is in northern Chile. Um, I was very lucky to be awarded a Marsden Grant in collaboration with Dr. Bernardo Ariaza and Dr. Vivian Standen. Um, and this was to look at the question of the agricultural transition across a very um, long time span from the archaic period through to the early formative period where we've got a fully agricultural society. 
Now this area is very well known archaeologically, it's a very famous world heritage area and we've got the earliest evidence for artificial mummification in the world there. Um, and they predate Egyptian mummification by about two millennia. Um, we hypothesise that the effects of the health chain of health change with the agricultural transition would have been heightened in this environment because it's the driest desert in the world, very very marginal environment, and we've got a very good um, time sequence from the archaic period. Um, we've got maritime hunter gatherer um, people, um, often referred to as chinchuro, um, who relied on um, obviously um, uh, fish but also wild terrestrial plants. The early formative period we see supplementary horticulturalism at about 3,500 years ago, and then the late formative period um, we've got evidence for a fully agricultural society where they were reliant on um, maize and potato. And I just wanted to show you a very short clip. Um, it's a new BBC video, and just to show you the marginal environment, and you'll actually hear Bernardo talking at the start. You're right. <laughs> so as part of this larger project, I um, was very fortunate to have a very smart PhD student at the time, um, who's now a research um, fellow in the department, Dr Annie Snoddy. She was working on looking at the potential impact of this changing subsistence economy on the prevalence of metabolic and infectious disease and the relationship between metabolic and infectious disease as well in the ancient Atacama Desert. Uh, and I just wanted to um, present a very small case series that was quite interested, interesting. This was from a site called Kiani 7. This is a coastal site, but it spanned between the late archaic and the early formative period. So from about 3,600 years ago to about 3,200 years ago. And we see that there's a cultural shift from this archaic period of Chonchuru mortuary practices, where we've got artificial mummification, <laughs> Um, and early evidence for the adoption of domesticates, including beans, squash, potato, and quinoa. So there were only 12 individuals at the site, um, eight uh, adults, but four of them were, were infants, and they were aged around the perinatal period. So from about 34 weeks prenatal to about two months postnatal. And as you can see here, they're all extraordinarily well-preserved. Um, and this is the case because it's such an arid environment. We've got amazing skeletal preservation. We also often have preservation of soft tissue, which ironically um, means that we can't look at some evidence for paleopathology on the bone. But she found that all the perinates, so all the infants, actually had pathology on the bones that was indicative of metabolic disease likely scurvy. And that was really another really interesting find is that there was a mother infant pair 
um, that both had evidence for scurvy. The mother had um, likely had scurvy. So it means that there was probably maternally transferred vitamin C deficiency, which isn't actually seen in the clinical literature. Um, so what does this mean? It probably means that um, it's um, indicative of a shift in resource utilisation from very high vitamin C wild resources that were present there and eating things like seal and porpoise liver to relying very much on low vitamin C processed cultivars potentially. Um, and it also um, highlights the fact that looking at uh, the in utero environment and including infant paleopathology within our studies in bioarchaeology is actually really important. And the fetal period could actually be a very good indicator for looking at micronutrient deficiency. I know it's boring, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we can also look at the maternal infant nexus by looking at diet and weaning of infants and children. Now obviously looking at infant diet is really important because it tells us um, something about um, the nutrition for infants and children, but weaning time is also really important to look at, especially with the agricultural transition. Weaning time for women is fundamentally linked to fertility. Um, and therefore the potential for population growth. And we know that there was a massive explosion in population in many different places in the world with the agricultural transition. Now we can look at this visibly through is um, isotope chemistry, um, and in particular looking at carbon and nitrogen. So when a baby is being breastfed, they're essentially eating um, food that's made by the mother's tissues. So they're always going to be a trophic level um, higher than the, um, the mother's tissues. So we can look at that um, in the archaeological context. So um, Dr Charlotte King, who's also a research fellow and a lecturer in the Department of Anatomy, did her postdoc as part of this larger project. And what she did is she sampled down through the dentine of, from the teeth, and through that you can produce individual life histories of um, infant diet and weaning. So our expectation is, and we can critique this expectation, there's a bit of, there's a, bit of a problem with it, um, but with the adoption of agriculture, when you've got more starchy carbohydrate food, it's assumed that you're going to be weaning your babies earlier because you've got more supplementary um, food for them. Again, there's some problems with this. Um, and um, so Charlotte was looking at this and she, what she did was she compared the um, pre-agricultural period with the um, early formative and the late formative period. But she didn't actually find that there was any temporal changes to the behaviour in weaning and infant feeding over time, which was quite interesting. It appeared to be idiosyncratic throughout the archaeological sequence, lots of individual variation, and also, interestingly, the weaning curves weren't as expected. So this is just one example of um, a weaning curve, and this is showing the, the nitrogen isotope values. And you can see here this is zero, so this is um, time of birth. Um, and after birth, this decreases by about eight parts per mil. So that's not um, indicative of a change in diet, that's too much. So it probably means that this baby in utero was experiencing a lot of stress and that was causing fractionation or a change in the isotope ratios in utero. So this is telling stories of individual stress. And when we're looking at um, health and diet in the past, we always have to be thinking about social factors that can impact on those things. My most recent Marsden, which is just finishing up now, um, was looking at the effects of social inequality um, in, in ancient China. And I just wanted to present a small case study looking at infant and child diet in the Eastern Zhou Dynasty in the central plains of China. This work is done in collaboration with Dong Yu from Shandong University, um, Dr. Melanie Miller from Otago and also Berkeley, um, and uh, Dr. Kate Pachunkina, who's at the city, uh, uh, CUNY. 
Um, at this time in the Eastern Zhou period, we see major cultural and technological changes. In terms of technology, we see advances in bronze and iron production, and also pottery and textiles. And we also see the development of a very patriarchal society um, and increasing um, social inequality, as you could imagine, um, by gender and also by um, social classes. So we looked at five different archaeological sites um, for the study, um, very close to the um, present day um, city of Jingzhou. Um, and Melanie plotted the data from the, um, at the, the um, isotopes showing nice weaning curves, but a lot of um, differences between individuals. So again, you've got a lot of individual variation in what's happening in terms of um, diet. But she sees that over time, the male averages of the nitrogen are slightly higher, meaning that they've probably got more meat consumption than um, the female average. And this is occurring across the whole of childhood. Um, so what does this mean? It probably means that these gendered identities um, are embodied for Eastern Zhou people from a very early age throughout through infant feeding practices. And we find a lot of evidence from the skeletal remains that there were very um, stark differences between health experiences of adult males and females as well. So to conclude, the patterns of health change um, with the agricultural transition are regionally specific and they show a range of, um, people show a range of adaptation to very diverse um, natural and social environments. And the recent advances in methods that we're using and approaches are showing this very strong nexus between the mother and the infant and their shared stories of stress. So I've got a lot of acknowledgements, <laughs> um, part one, for my collaborators. Um, firstly, I want to acknowledge the heads of department over the years from when I was a student through to when I've been an academic. And in particular, I want to acknowledge Dave Gretton, who's unfortunately in Wellington tonight. Um, he's always been a great mentor. Neil Gemmell has always put me forward for things. So thank you very much for that. I'm not sure why, but it was lovely. <laughs> um, Lisa, um, thank you very much for supporting my promotion application. I really appreciate it. And Christine and um, for being a great new head of department and being so supportive. And also to Louise and John, who are the deputy heads of department at the moment. I also want to give a massive, massive shout out to our amazing professional team. And I've got so many other names that can be put on that. So if you're not on that, I'm really sorry. I was probably thinking of you, but I was too anxious and didn't put them all in. Um, our, our large lab group as well. And there's many other people um, and people within the university and also my international collaborators um, and funders. And last but not least, I want to acknowledge my students that I've had, my postgrad students. Um, I wanted to do a collage of all the faces, but I realised I wasn't going to have enough room. Um, I probably learn more from students than they learn from me, so it's really um, great academically, and you kind of give me a reason to get out of bed every day. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming, everyone. Jotted down a few notes. Is this on? Oh, it is. So um, it's my job to um, be the person who gets to close after that, and it's always difficult to be the one who follows a fantastic talk. So um, I will try to uh, keep this brief. I, I hope that you were able to see demonstrated quite clearly um, Sean's world leading uh, science and uh, reflected in her fantastic collegial um, and peer. Uh, support um, that she that has really kind of made her through her work a world-leading figure in childhood bioarchaeology. 
So I think Shauna exemplifies excellence um, through traditional academic uh, metrics. So she's driven, she's high integrity, critical inquiry, training of students, peer esteem, massive publications, books, um, et cetera. But I think one of the things that came through here um, quite clearly is that Sean is also um, an exemplary modern academic. So she's been able to balance motherhood with a fantastic, um, uh, enviable uh, academic career. And one of the things that hasn't really been said, but she was kind of subtly woven through some of the things that she talked about, is her unwavering support for women in science, and particularly young women in science. She has been an advocate and a supporter and a fantastic mentor for heaps and heaps of female junior and now growing into senior academics. She's also a fantastic contributor to communities. She's out there talking about her research, trying to get people enthusiastic, share her science and her findings. And she does this through outreach in our own community, but of course also she's deeply invested in bringing her research and her passion for her work to the communities that she works with in all of the regions of the world that we've heard about. And um, I guess from my perspective as a new HOD, I just really wanted to say that in the department, she's uh, an invaluable colleague. She's kind and generous and intelligent and always willing to help out with a smiling face. And I think I wanna really just end with that and thank you, Sean, for a fantastic talk and for all of the things that you, congratulate you for all of the things you've achieved and just to ask everybody here to join me in thanking Sean for her. I have, a, I have a gift that um, we would like to present to Sean on, the, um, on behalf of the University of Otago to thank you for your lecture and of course to congratulate you on your promotion. Thank you.